Each year around this time, I open up my TimeHop app and I'm reminded of a night three years ago. Photos of softball-sized black and blue bruises all over the right side of my body come up. I'm honestly somewhat thankful for that, because it could have been much worse. I'll just never know. Three years ago, after a blackout Wednesday night with friends, I found myself locked out of my partner at the time's apartment at around 3 a.m. She was out with co-workers doing the same after her serving shift ended. We live in a big city, so I'd taken the train from where the night ended with my friends straight to her place and decided I'd just wait for her rather than head back home as the commute would be another half hour or so and my phone was dying. I was honestly just ready to sleep. In hindsight, I obviously just should have headed to my own apartment that night. After multiple texts and phone calls from me to her to come home, my partner being thoroughly annoyed with me was not in any rush to end their night. Drunk and upset, I sat inside the entrance gate to her apartment community and sulked. It was raining and cold, and I was exhausted. Putting myself in this situation all alone was my parents' worst nightmare, but at this point my phone was dead. I didn't have enough cab money and there was no way in hell I was walking 15 minutes back to the train to head to my own apartment. A few minutes later, a man in a ski mask, sunglasses, and an oversized parka walks up to me. I remember him so vividly asking, Are you okay? I responded that I was fine and to please stay away from me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, for a split second, he was genuinely concerned. I mean, here I was, a college-aged girl, sitting outside in the rain at 3 a.m., completely alone. But, at 3 a.m., you don't just approach a girl dressed like that and mean no harm. He then brandished an exacto knife and then asked, You sure you're okay? He picked me up with one hand while repeatedly striking at the back of my hood with the knife. All I could do was scream. I know I asked him why he was doing this, but I couldn't even bring myself to pull out the mace in my coat pocket. I was so stunned. Talk about fight, flight, or freeze. I don't know if it was a car that drove by or my screaming that caused him to stop, but after the longest 30 seconds or so of my life, he threw me to the ground and ran, leaving me with those awful aforementioned bruises. I'll be forever grateful for the thick hood on my coat. That came away with some knife cuts. Had my hood not been up, he would have absolutely sliced the back of my neck and head. My partner pulled up in a cab a few minutes later. At least I think it was a few minutes later. It was really a blur. I definitely went into a state of shock. We called 911 from her charged phone. Stayed awake for the police to come and take a report, but we didn't hear much else afterward. There's a decent amount of crime in my city, so I wasn't really expecting much to come of it. What scares me the most is that number one, I still don't know what the man wanted. Number two, he knows what I look like and I have absolutely no idea what he looks like. And number three, I'm pretty certain I was followed all the way from the transit station to the apartment complex, which was a fairly long walk. Those three reasons still give me chills. This is more backpacking than a walk, but this fucking terrifies me to this day. Our planned camping spot for the night was full. We'd backpacked all day to get to that location, and there wasn't anywhere close to set up our tents. We called our guy, on the outside, to come pick us up as it was getting late. We didn't have anywhere to set up camp, and a storm was approaching. We hiked to the nearest exit point on the trail, met our pickup guy, and he drove us a few miles to the nearest campsite we were familiar with that we could basically drive up to. Long logging path pretty deep in the mountains that we'd hiked to in previous years, so we were kind of familiar with the area. 
Anyways, we hop out of the van and it's pitch black out. No moon. It's April in the mountains and still pretty chilly. We're cold, hungry, and exhausted. That's when we notice this fuck staring at us from behind a tree. I know this sounds like a no sleep story, but it's 100% true and probably the most scared I've ever been. We notice this guy, no headlamp, no equipment, no backpack, just standing there. One of our group, a former marine, yells at him to come out and explain what his deal is. This guy walks a few feet out from behind the tree, and we all shine our lights at him. And I shit you not, this guy's white t-shirt is covered in what looks like blood smears. He's pretty rough looking, long hair, long beard, crazy eyes, and he was wearing a bloody t-shirt and shorts in 35 degree weather at night. We're all pretty freaked out, and this is a pretty experienced group of hikers who've seen some shit. We ask the guy what his deal is, and he says we can't camp here. We tell him that's exactly what we plan to do, and he says, I don't think that's a good idea for any of you. We kind of turn and discuss as a group, and when we look back, he's hidden back behind the tree. As a group, we basically decided none of us were getting any sleep that night if we stayed here, so we packed up the van and left. As we were pulling out, this guy pulled out one of those red filtered flashlights and ran after our van. I'm not kidding, he followed us for at least a quarter mile on foot. He was fast as fuck. We passed a park ranger on the road and flagged him down to tell him how weird that guy was acting, and he said he'd go investigate. I didn't hear anything about it again for five years. For the longest time, I thought he was probably some pot farmer who had a nearby plot, or a moonshiner who was just living in the woods and didn't want us near his still. People hunt all the time out there, which would maybe explain the blood a bit but I was recently at an event with some of the guys again for the first time in years, and that creepy guy from the woods got brought up. One of them, who still lives nearby, broke out his phone and said, I forgot to tell you guys, I saw him again. He pulls up a news article, and there he was. It's so obviously the same guy. He'd been arrested for murdering some poor girl on the trail. The timelines didn't match up, so I fully believe we saw this guy shortly after he murdered someone else. He hasn't been charged with anything else as far as I'm aware. I'm not backpacking without a gun anymore. This happened to me one night at 2 a.m., I work out of an art studio in downtown Fargo, North Dakota. It's between the two shadiest bars in town, so I see a lot of odd people. Usually, my interactions with them are harmless or sad, but from time to time, someone comes along that really freaks me out. One night I was pulling a late one and ended up leaving at around 2am. When I left my shop, I saw that a train was coming through so I knew I would have to wait for a while. On my side of the street, I saw a group of men standing around and talking. When I stopped, they all looked at me and my gut dropped hard. I really cannot stress how this gut feeling seemed so instinctual. I see people by these bars all the time, but this was a different sensation. They began to walk to me. I turned to go back to my shop and they increased their pace. The image that spurned into my brain is of the guy that was at the front. He had a cigarette sticking out of his mouth and was clearly pretending to look the other way as he came near. I dashed into my shop, slammed the door closed and locked it. The man, or men, tried to open it and began pounding on the other side. Let me in, man, one of them said. I grabbed a hatchet from the tools and talk through the locked door. One thing I learned from working downtown around these people is that you need to keep a cool demeanor. If you get aggressive or have fear in your voice, they tend to stick around. If my responses seem odd, that is why. 
Let me be clear, I was terrified. What's up, man? I asked. We got some ladies out here. Let us in. We just want to have a good time. The guy said. Not interested. Leave me alone. I responded. We got more ladies coming. Come on. He tried to open the door again. I called 911 and I could hear him talking to his friends out front. They weren't laughing. Just talking. That chilled me. Usually the creeps downtown are just drunk and rude. They laugh and blunder around. These guys did not sound drunk. Police showed up and were kind enough to drive me home. The group was nowhere to be seen. The thing that freaks me out is that I'm an average-sized guy in his mid-twenties. The clothes I had on were my shop clothes and did not scream, carrying cash. Usually I'm the one walking girls to their cars in diffusing situations. I don't know what they wanted. If it wasn't closer to my shop, I don't know what would have happened. So this was a few years back, and I was walking home from a friend's house after hanging at hers after school. It was around 9.30pm in summer, so the sun had for the most part set. It was relatively dark, but still bright enough where I could make out the things around me. I was stoned, and walking very slowly down the road to my house, which was only about a 20 minute walk from my friend's. The majority of my walk was spent on a straight, quiet suburban street that was very familiar to me as I'd done this walk plenty of times before. After maybe five minutes of walking, I noticed the first and only car to drive past. It was an old, beat-up white Honda, which I didn't take much notice to, until another few minutes passed and it drove past again. Still, I wasn't concerned and continued about my walk, admiring the cracks in the pavement, or doing whatever else a stoned 14-year-old does on a walk. Another minute passes, and this car drives past again, this time more slowly, and I feel my stomach drop. I couldn't make out who was inside, but I knew something was off. I've always been very timid, so I try to convince myself it's just paranoia, and that I was just being dramatic, until it drives past again, about two minutes later, and then parked about ten feet in front of me. As I approach the car, I kept my head down, but I hear a, Hey there. And sure enough, I look up, and there was a rough-looking man, who you could tell just from appearance alone, that he smelt like stale cigarettes and body odor, sitting in the driver's seat, smiling at me. The lack of teeth and dirty shirt this man had on gave me a horrible vibe, so I just gave a little smile back and continued walking. I look up and notice he's driving alongside me. He asked if I had directions to the closest gas station. I stopped and pointed in the general direction and told him where to go and that it was less than a five minute drive away. When out of nowhere, he just started to laugh. I kind of just stared in confusion and fear as he squinted his eyes at me like he was trying to get a better look at my face. Then he said, I'll take a guess, but I think I can tell from those eyes. You've been smoking pot, little miss. I kind of just laughed and tried to walk away when he said, come back. So I stopped in my tracks. Why I didn't just keep walking is beyond me. But I turned around and he pulls out a rather large bag of weed and asks if I want some. I tell him I'm okay and I have no money and he said something along the lines of, I don't need your money, take it. I reassure him I'm fine and don't need it and try to continue walking. But nonetheless, he continued driving alongside me. He then asked if I need a ride home and tells me it's too dark to be walking alone which really frightened me. He continued trying to coerce me into his car, and I became more and more unsettled. I began to look for the closest house with the lights on, 
and after finding one, I tell him, this is my house, good night, and I walk up some stranger's driveway and walk straight into their home. There was a middle-aged couple sitting in the living room, and they looked extremely shocked and equally angry, and I just started to sob out of shock and relief and apologized profusely. I explained to them what just happened, and the very kind lady assured me I did the right thing and gave me a ride home. Looking back, I probably should have knocked, but I was scared, under the influence and still a child, and the homeowners were very understanding. It's still one of the scariest things that has happened to me, but I'm so glad that I trusted my gut and got away from the man whose intentions seemed anything but pure. I still consider myself lucky that I got away. A bit of context here. I was around 10 to 11 years old when this happened, old enough to stay home alone but not old enough to recognize some red flags. I attended camp over the summer, the typical 8 to 3 routine. My house sits close to the end of my street, which forms a U, but for some reason the bus driver would never drop me off at my house. I would always get dropped off at the end of my street, where I would toddle myself along back home. Both my parents worked late hours, sometimes not getting home until 8 p.m., and it would be very expensive to hire a babysitter for four to five hours a day, five days a week. So, starting sixth grade, when the bus dropped me off at home, I would be by myself. I'd do the usual middle school routine, play games online and watch TV. Occasionally my neighbor's cat would come into my backyard, and I would feed and pet her as a way to get outside. The only computer in the house was in my dad's workroom, which has a window overlooking the deck and a window overlooking the side of the house. We have large bay windows in the living room, dining room, and kitchen of my house. And since we sit on a hill, you can pretty much see the entire backyard from a nice vantage point. So most days when I got home, I'd toss off my backpack and go right to that room. And you could see me walk from my front door and pop up by the computer from outside. Unfortunately, this would lead to something that I had forgotten about up until now. When I got off the bus, I did as expected. Go into my dad's workroom and play computer games. About 30 minutes into this, I can hear a faint meowing coming from the outside window. I pause the game and look outside, thinking maybe the neighbor's cat had wandered over. Nothing. I just sat back down and resumed playing, only to hear the meowing again. It was quiet but noticeable, and so I checked the other window. Nothing again. This routine happened for a good ten minutes, and eventually I got frustrated and went into the living room to watch TV. Not even two minutes later, meowing from the window I was sitting right beside. Now I was confused and a little creeped out, so I shut the blinds and kept trying to watch TV. The meows continued, but only when they came from the window right behind me did I jump and leave the living room, officially skeeved. I went into my bedroom, where the blinds were down but still cracked for some sunlight. I tried my best to read a book, only to hear a meow coming from outside my bedroom window. This was enough to make me call my dad, concerned that maybe the cat was hurt, but I couldn't see it to be sure. He said he would have the neighbor come check it out and call me back later. Ten minutes go by, and I get a call from my dad saying he was coming home from work. Nothing urgent in his voice, just that his job had gotten cancelled and he would come home early. I thought nothing of it and when he got home did I realize the cat noises had stopped. Fast forward to the present, and I asked my dad about the strange incident, thinking it was funny the cat had followed me around. What he told me next made my blood run cold. After I called him, my neighbor did indeed come to check on the house. What he found were large footprints 
leading in circles all around the house, clustered close to the walls so that even if I looked outside and I wouldn't see anything, someone had been stalking me through my house, seeing where I was through the windows and making cat noises to try and get me to come outside. They must have known I was home alone, since it was easy to see me walk around by myself down the street and let myself in. My neighbor immediately called my dad and searched the property, but he found no one. The police weren't called, since there was nothing but footprints that led off into the woods and got lost, and I never saw anyone. My dad stayed home with me for the rest of the week. It sickens me to know that there are people who would use these tactics to try and lure kids out of their homes, and from there, do whatever they wanted with them. First, we'll need context. My old house was pretty pumped up on security. We had finger ID, passcodes on doors, cameras everywhere, an automatic security system that could call the police or play fake. The cops had been called, blah blah blah. This story happened a few years back. My dad noticed a weird looking man pretty covered up lurking on the streets just outside of our house. We thought nothing of it, since sometimes you get the occasional drunk or high person wandering around, but this man started to inch closer to our house. First, being on the opposite side of our street, and before we knew it, being basically on our property. We just sort of watched him to see what he would do. I'm pretty sure we just got bored and walked away and just forgot. Then we started to hear a strange noise coming from downstairs. We decided to switch on the camera, and sure enough, this guy is banging on our door, trying to get in. Then he looks through a window. He gives up and then starts to go around to the side. He starts to head up the stairs, and my dad decided to go to the side of the house where he was with a kitchen knife and scream at him. This guy runs, and we don't see him again. And that'd be the end, right? Wrong. This guy comes back again. I guess he saw that the car was gone from the driveway. The guy looks around again. We did not want to confront this guy so I had the idea of playing the fake cop alert that could be heard outside. So, we played it, and as soon as this guy heard it, he ran. We never saw him again, and never want to. What makes this story creepier is that on the news later, it showed a guy who lurked around houses and killed people. That man had been arrested. It was the same man who was at our house. There's an abandoned and boarded up World War II fort in the southern part of Belgium that we often sneak into with the scouts. Getting in there requires scaling a sheer wall next to a relatively busy road, so you're being really quiet, making no light, and cowering every time a car passes by so they don't spot you in the lights. The atmosphere is set. The moment you enter, it's like diving into water. Sound stops, and the entire place is a constant 14 degrees Celsius, with a slight breeze passing through. The tunnel is barely large enough for me to pass through without turning my body sideways. The tunnel is just high enough to work up a decent gate while hunched over. If somebody ahead of you blocks a passage for a moment, the breeze stops, and it feels like the entire tunnel network takes a breath. Because of the way the tunnels are constructed, they echo in such a way that your own footsteps seem to be coming from behind you. They also seem to take one more step than you do when you stop. Of course, we don't allow the guys and gals to take any source of light in there, so it's pretty scary overall. So I'm in there posted at a side passage to ensure everyone takes the same path and doesn't get lost. I go in first, 
before any of the climbers arrive, so they don't know there are friendly faces in there to help them. I'm in there for a while, just waiting for the first to come by, when I see a dancing little light coming down the long hallway. I quietly settle back in my nook and wait for whoever was smart enough to hide some matches and take them away. The light quietly bobs closer when I realize there aren't any footsteps accompanying it. I poke my head around the corner, just in time to see it disappear. I hear no footsteps still. I settle back and wait some more when I realize I do hear some scuffling. Very faint, breathing noises, but still very faint. I become aware of a wet heat coming from right in front of me, with a faint smell of a person, sweat, dirt. Suddenly I realize someone's there, right in front of me, inches from my face. The breathing stops suddenly. Whatever it is, is aware of me as well. Whatever or whoever it is, we're both holding our breath, both acutely aware of each other. It takes ages. I'm sitting there, unable to move, speak, or breathe properly. The wet heat passes, and some minutes later, I become aware of a very faint light coming from my right side, which soon dissipates and leaves. Some time later still, I hear the familiar stomping of combat boots coming down the hallway from my left. I stop the person, tell them to keep following the passageway, and take the first right they come to. Out of curiosity, I ask who went in first. No one. He went in first. And it was explained much later. The first guy got lost down a dead-end side passage, and the second girl passed him by. She got nervous from the footsteps and removed her shoes. She saw me poke my head from around the corner and drop the match. She passed me very slowly. One of the later checkpoints said she was crying her eyes out. This was a few years ago in my old house, around Halloween. One day, I was home alone in my house. I have a wife, three kids, and a dog. I'm in my basement cutting wood and working, when all of a sudden I hear thumping on the ceiling above me. It's rhythmic and almost perfectly in beat. I'm a handyman and do a lot of my own fixing and know the usual sounds houses make. This was not usual. I start to follow the thumping around the first floor. It's as if someone is walking around. I call out my wife's name. No answer. My kids. No answer. Just soft moaning with the thumps. My dog is with me in the basement and following the sound with me with his tail straight up, completely silent. This was weird because I have a loud, jumpy dog. I then slowly follow the thumping to the steps, and I hear a weak, old woman's voice calling for Jimmy over and over. Ignoring my hellos, she keeps walking around my first floor, calling out, moaning, and thumping. I grab my dog by the collar and leave through the basement door, and I walk around the outside of my house. I go up the street and there's a younger couple calling out for someone. They're calling out for someone called Nancy. I go up to them and say, Are you Jimmy? The guy looks at me and simultaneous relief and confusion crossed his face. He tells me that's his dad's name but he passed years ago. It turns out Nancy was his mom with some kind of mental issues. She snuck out of their house up the road. Her family lived in my house before we did, and she was having some kind of episode. She went looking for her husband in her home. Oh, she also has a wooden leg. I don't know the story, but that was the thumping. We got her home safely, and I also double locked the doors from that point on. I encourage you to do the same.
I often like to go out running in the summer, or whenever the weather is nice. This happened a week before I was supposed to start high school. I thought about going running that day, but I got that idea in the morning, and I run in the evening while the sun is still up, but it isn't as hot as it is in the day, and there isn't a chance for it to get hotter if I don't manage to get back in time like in the morning. Well, of course I forgot my promise to myself, and only remember it around 9pm. Now it's the end of summer, so the sun is already setting sooner than I'm used to. But I go. Eh, I'll get back in like an hour or so. It'll be fine. I already have been putting off running, so I don't want to put it off again. I should probably mention that I'm a female, and even though a lot of girls I know change the side of the road they walk on when they see even distinctly drunk-looking guys walking, I was the one calling them scared and was ready to take on the first rogue who tried to get me. I also live in a less populated area out of town, where almost everyone knows everyone, so I was feeling extra sure of my safety. What a naive fool, I know. So, I go out. I start my run and it's fine. It's getting a bit dark, but I can still see the running track, so it's all good. I start to feel a bit off when I see a pair walking in front of me. When I get closer, they turn out to be just teen guys, and I run past them with no problem. When I finally reach the usual point in my run where I turn around, at a cemetery, it has gotten pretty dark out. I drink some water from my bottle, and just stand there under a tree next to the gate in the territory of the cemetery. But I don't sit down where I usually do, because the bench is next to a fence, and the darkness has finally made me a little weary about being alone and having someone jumping me. It's pretty funny that that's what scared me the most at the time. When I catch my breath, I stay for a few more minutes just listening to the wind. I see a bike drive past the cemetery, taking the route I will take while running back. I leave my resting place and it's gotten really dark, dark enough that I could barely see two meters in front of me. I start slowly running back. After about 15 meters or so, I start hearing voices. A couple more meters, and I can clearly hear someone talking. My thoughts immediately jump to a conclusion that there are at least two people in front of me if I'm hearing a conversation. Now I slow down even more until I get close enough to actually hear what's being said. Keep in mind it's completely dark and this rogue doesn't have street lights, so I can't see anything. I get close enough to finally make out the words, and my heart sinks at what I hear. I can't recall the exact words that were said, but I did hear. I see this girl. I could just pull her into the bushes. There were tall bushes lining one side of the running track. As I said, at first, my heart stops but immediately after I go into fight or flight mode, I can hear my heart beating in my ears and I'm full of adrenaline, the bad kind. I know I can't just stop or he will know I heard what he said, so I continue to walk, but thank God that the running track is separated from the road by a small grass field, so I go to the side of the road, making some distance between us. I keep looking at him. Keep in mind, I still don't even know how many people are there, but I see a square of light, presumably a phone, and then I hear him jump on his bicycle and drive off. It turned out he was talking on the phone, but just because he wasn't alone didn't mean I was less scared of him. I walk on the side of the road for a good few minutes until I'm sure he would be far away from me, and once I get back on the running track, I sprint home like crazy. All the way back, I was shaking with fear and looking at the bushes and the cars that passed me with delirium, squishing my water bottle in my hand, ready to smack anyone who came close to me. When I finally reached the first road lights, I felt like I escaped death. This is the late 80s, early 90s. I was around 6 to 7 years old. 
I am at home with my sister, who's 14 to 15 at the time. We grew up in a small Texas town. Everyone knows everybody. We're home alone this particular night, and my folks let my sister babysit me frequently. We always got along due to our age gap. It's about 8 p.m. in the winter, so it's dark, and we're in the common room since that's where the TV was, watching 60 minutes or 48 hours or hard copy or some shit. It was one of those news pieces on CBS that chronicle large crimes and death, things like trafficking, murders, kidnappings, and the like. Basically, a gritty lifetime special. This one was a typical story. Guy next door that was quiet went on a rampage in his next door neighbor's house, mutilating them and kidnapping their young daughter. Well, the thing about our house common room is the door leading to the backyard was a large glass door on a wall of floor-to-ceiling windows. Nothing but blackness beyond it, unless you have the back light on, which we did not. The front door is on the other side of the room with a small entryway. This is a solid door, so you cannot see what's beyond it, with a glass storm door on the outside of it. About 45 minutes into the show, they're talking about the ongoing manhunt for this crazy guy, and all of a sudden there's banging. It's coming from the front door. We jump the fuck up and scream like banshees. Dead silence now. The only lights on in the house are the kitchen down the hall from the common room we were in, and the light from the TV. We start thinking something on the porch had simply blown against the door. This was West Texas, crazy strong winds out that way. Well, a minute or two of silence and us holding each other post-adrenaline overdose passes. Just when we are about to declare everything is safe, we hear the storm door on the outside of our front door close. Fuck. Someone had to have opened the door to be able to bang on the front door like that. Shit. We're both frozen in the middle of the room, on the floor, where we've been watching TV. My sister crawls over to the TV and turns it off. It was an old TV, so you had to turn the metal dial to switch it off. Which it does with a mildly loud thunk. Now it's just us in a room dimly lit by the kitchen light down the hall. I do not remember how much time passed with me frozen and my sister still crouched by the now off TV, but we kept making eye contact, then looking at the front door. I remember this part vividly. I'm on my knees sitting on my feet and I turn around to look at the back wall of windows and glass door. We hear and I see the back doorknob turn. It was locked on the knob, but not deadbolted. It rattles slightly, as if someone is gently trying the handle. Neither of us make a sound. We just held our breath. And then banging, loud as hell as if someone's trying to force the door open, just jerking it back and forth. The whole wall of windows is vibrating violently, and I can see with each jerk of the door how my slight reflection gets fuzzy, then clear, and then back to fuzzy. My sister flips her shit and screams bloody murder. I'm still frozen on the floor. She gets up and basically drags me into her bedroom, slams the door, and throws her mattress and anything she can in front of her door. Thankfully, she'd remembered the phone. One of those ungodly heavy, beige plastic, long metal antenna portable phones. We still had to direct dial the sheriff there, and in her panic, she didn't remember the number. She just hit redial on the phone. It was one of her friends, and she tells them in broken gasps that someone is trying to get into our house, and they need to get there right now. I'm curled up on the floor and cannot stop shaking. We don't hear anything else until we see the lights of my sister's friend and her parents driving up to the house. We never did find out who was at the door or why. There was no signs that anything happened, except a couple of scuff marks at the bottom of the back door that we couldn't remember if they were there beforehand or not. Nothing like that has happened to me or her since, but we for damn sure never forgot to lock a door after that. This encounter happened when I was about 10 years old. 
My sister and I were home alone since it was during the summer, but our mom and grandmother were busy, so they couldn't stay home with us. We were used to being home alone during the summer, so it wasn't a big deal. The only thing we could not do was go outside or open the door if someone knocked. During this day, I had gotten up and started to play The Sims 2 in our kitchen. My sister was watching TV in our den. A few hours into gaming, I thought I heard the doorbell ring. At first, I thought it was my game, but I turned off the sound. So I asked my sister if she heard the doorbell. She replied that she hadn't. She said it was probably just the show she was watching. I brushed it off and went back to playing my game. About ten minutes later, I see a reflection on my computer of a man in a suit, his hands cupped around his eyes looking through the glass doors behind me. I turn around to be face to face with this strange man I'd never seen before. I had no idea how long he'd been watching me. He waved at me like he knew me from somewhere. I called my sister's name, who had not noticed the man yet. She grabs the house phone, quickly calling our grandmother. Now, we had seen salespeople before. None of them looked like this guy. He was wearing a full-on black suit that did not fit him. If not strange enough that this guy was wearing a suit in 99 degrees, he was also carrying a briefcase. All the salespeople I'd seen only ever had a clipboard or maybe a couple of flyers but this man had a briefcase. The next flag that came with this guy, he walked around our house to come to the back door, which during his little trip, he would have seen there wasn't a car in the driveway, indicating no one was home. As I was getting up to hide, the man reached down and grabbed the doorknob. He started to jiggle it forcefully. Thankfully, the door was locked. He looks at me, smiling gestured at me to come unlock the door for him. All the noise he'd been making had now set off our 75-pound lab mix, making her go batshit crazy. No way she was gonna let this guy get to us if he did get in. My sister tells me our grandmother is on the way, and she wanted us to hide in the back of the house in her room until she could get home. My sister hands me the phone, then runs into the kitchen to grab the biggest knife we have. I can hear her yelling at the guy that we called the cops. She comes back into the room with me, and we shut the door. She tells me after she lied to the guy about calling the cops. She said that he started laughing like she just told the funniest joke he'd ever heard. A little while later, we heard the door open and my grandmother calling us. We come out to meet her. She tells us she did not see a man anywhere in sight. She'd walked around the whole house before unlocking the door. She also thought it was weird if he was a salesperson, he would have left a note saying, Sorry we missed you. She ended up taking the rest of the day off to stay with us, also so she could watch to see if the man would come back around. It's been 11 years since this encounter, and I still don't want to know what was in his briefcase. I grew up in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I was 12 years old, and let's just say I didn't have the easiest of upbringings. I was smoking, drinking, and staying out late around this time of my life. So I was bunking off of school, my mom was at work, and it was late morning time around 11am. I wanted to buy some cigarettes, but as I was well under the legal age, I had to hang around outside the shop and asked strangers if they would take my money and purchase them for me. About a mile and a half from my house, there was a little shop called The Spar. It was on a fairly busy road. A row of hedges lined one side, with a gap that led into the field beyond, and houses on the opposite side. So I was standing maybe 15 paces from the shop, waiting for people to walk past so I could ask them to purchase my cigarettes. I usually second-guessed if they would be willing by how they looked. I asked a lady, maybe mid-forties, shoulder-length blonde hair, black business trousers, pink elbow-length jumper, looked like she smoked, and she said no. I asked a guy, maybe mid-fifties, shaved brown hair. He was wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. 
he ignored me. So I was getting desperate by this point and decided upon asking anybody that came by. Then I see a rather disheveled looking man coming up the road towards me, past the row of hedges. He was wearing dirty dark brown suit trousers and a button up dark brown dirty velvet jacket. He had a black bowler kind of hat on and he kind of limped a bit as he walked. As he got closer to me, and I was trying to suss out if he looked like the type that would possibly purchase a 12-year-old cigarettes. I noticed he was probably homeless and possibly in his late 50s to early 60s. But I thought, hey, he probably smokes, I'll ask him. As he approached me, I gave him the usual line. Excuse me, mate, would you please go into that shop and get some cigarettes for me? He stopped and thought for a second, then said... How old are you? I lied. I'm 15, almost 16. And he said, All right, which ones do you want? And held out a really dirty hand. I gave him my money and asked him to get some 10 sovereign. I had the exact change. He goes into the shop and I'm waiting outside excited. I'm finally getting my cigarettes and can go home and chill out before I have to leave the house again to make it look like I've just got home from school. He comes out and gives me twenty sovereign. I miff to say the least and say, but I only gave you enough money for ten, and I start panicking because I don't have any extra money on me to give him. At this point, he hooks my arm in his, holding my arm firmly to his side, and starts to walk back towards the hedge-lined road, all the while, he's telling me how I can make up for not having the extra money for the cigarettes. I'm kind of stunned at this point, and my mind is blank. I guess I was in some kind of shock. He leads me through a gap in the hedges and into the field, all the while talking non-stop, still briskly walking with my arm locked in his. He's telling me how I can come to his house and help him fix the roof tiles. I'm still in silent shock. The field is huge, and I can see it leads into more fields and more fields. I can hear the cars behind me getting more distant. I can't see any houses for miles. There's just fields. He's still talking, but I'm not taking in what he's saying. My mind starts to race. I finally realize something about this isn't quite right, and I have to get away. As he's walking, still holding my arm, I suddenly and violently pull back with my arm straight. My arm slides out of his very quickly and he goes flying forwards and lands in a heap on the floor and I take one big step backwards. I'm terrified at this point, but still in shock. I can't speak. He's laying on the ground, groaning and holding his leg. It's like he's in a lot of pain. Why do you do that for? You really hurt me. Help me up. Help me up. He's holding his leg and puts his hand out for me to help him up. I'm frozen. My mind is racing so fast. I'm looking at this disheveled man right now in the eye, laying on the ground, groaning like he's in pain. But something about this situation didn't sit right with me. My gut was telling me to run. Don't help him. I bought you those cigarettes, didn't I? I helped you out. Why did you do this? You've hurt me. Help me up. I take another step backwards, all the while looking into his green eyes. All of a sudden he stops groaning and asking for me to help him up. He points his finger at me, looking me right in the eye and says, You're a smart girl. It was like an electric shock ran through my body and I turn and run. I don't look back, I just run as fast as I can. When I'd gotten off the hedge-lined road and turned into the next road, I slow down as I'm out of breath. I start bawling my eyes out and I'm shaking uncontrollably. I keep checking behind me, catch my breath, and don't stop running until I get home. At the very least, I was terrified I'd bump into that man again. And I never tried to buy cigarettes from that shop ever again.
This took place a couple of years ago in Hollywood, Florida. I was in middle school at the time. Myself, my sister, and my mom all were on our porch unlocking the door after coming home from school. We noticed something was off right away because our alarm didn't go off, and my mom always made it a point to set the alarm before we leave the house. Although that was weird, and we noticed and commented about it, it was very possible that we just forgot to set it. Because of that possibility, we just ignored it and moved on. As we entered the house and were beginning to set our backpacks and other stuff down, I heard a drawer close in my bedroom. I thought I was just hearing things, so I looked at my mom and was about to ask her if she heard something. My mom looked at me at the same time, and her look of horror was enough for me to realize that she heard the same thing. My sister didn't seem to notice because she had earphones in. The sound and the fact that the alarm was off was enough for my mom to decide to get us out of there. She loudly said, I want to show you guys something in the backyard, because she didn't want anyone in the house to know that we heard them and that that's why we were leaving the house. My sister looked confused, but I knew exactly why my mom said this. As we entered the backyard and shut the door behind us, we sped walk toward the alley behind our house. The only thing separating us from it was a wooden fence. Once we reached the fence, we opened the gate and began to exit the alley. It was the last exit through the gate, and before I shut it, I looked at the house one last time. To my horror, I saw someone looking at me through our curtains. We called the police, and they found no one, and nothing was stolen. I never told anyone about what I saw. Several years ago, I worked at the crisis unit for the acutely mentally ill. It was a 10-bed unit where individuals would come to stay as a step down from a psychiatric hospitalization or a diversion to prevent psychiatric hospitalization. I often worked alone on the weekends. One Friday evening, we received an admission. Michael. His background information was provided with a referral, indicating a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder and recent release from prison after serving a sentence for murder. I completed the initial intake meeting with Michael, during which time he said some sexually explicit things to me. I made it clear that this was inappropriate and that confidentiality was limited in that the staff working on the unit, as part of his treatment team, would be privy to anything he said in the interview or subsequent one-on-one -on -one sessions. He responded well to the redirection. We finished the intake, and I went about the rest of my shift until about 11 p.m. that night, when he approached the officer and asked if I was working alone. Luckily, at the time, I wasn't alone and I told him that my male co-worker was in the adjoining office. After this encounter, I explained the situation to my co-worker, who read my shift summary and decided to sit down with Michael and tell him the way he was acting was not acceptable, and he could risk being released from the program if it continued. The next morning, I was working alone from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Around 9 a.m., I went to wake up another client, Jeremy to administer his medications. The room Jeremy was assigned was at the end of the hallway, and he was usually slow to get up in the mornings. While I was knocking on Jeremy's door, Michael approached me to tell me he didn't appreciate that I shared the things he said to me with my male co-worker. I explained to Michael that he knew what he said was inappropriate, and that he knew anything he said to me would be shared with the rest of the treatment team. Michael became more agitated and got in my face, backing me into the corner in front of Jeremy's bedroom door. At this point, Jeremy had woken up and heard what was happening outside his room. Jeremy came out of his room, stood between Michael and myself, and told Michael that he needed to walk away and cool down. Michael went back to his room, and I contacted my supervisor, who told me to document the encounter and continue my shift. Needless to say, 
I left that job shortly after this incident. I'm thankful for Jeremy and that he had the presence of mind to intervene on my behalf. I often wonder what would have happened if Jeremy wouldn't have woken up, or if he would have been in a more severe state of mental illness and would have become agitated as well. So, Michael, let's never meet again. I've been running in these woods for as long as I can remember, but this might make me change my mind. The story began around 6.30pm. I had finished eating and decided to go on a run as usual. I always used the same path, cross the street, run for a kilometer, and pass the gate that goes into the woods. Something important to note is that the trail I use in the forests is separated about halfway through. One is paved and the other isn't. I usually go into the unpaved path first and then turn into the paved one after about three kilometers. Nothing ever really goes wrong. I meet some rare people walking their dogs, but other than that, I'm pretty alone. At least, I thought I was. I'd been running for a while now when I heard a notification coming from my phone. An airdrop notification. Since I didn't want to make it look like I was worried, I kept running for a couple of minutes and then stopped to change the music. I opened the airdrop dreadfully. Who the hell was sending me stuff? I was pretty sure I was alone. I clicked on the drop and my heart sunk. It was a Snapchat picture of me running with the caption, You look good. I didn't turn around. Instead, I kept running like nothing happened until I reached a certain point. You see, the forest is surrounded by a fence to stop children from coming in unsupervised, and I didn't like that rule when I was little, so my friends and I cut a hole in it. When I was aligned with that hole, I quickly turned and buried myself into the forest, aiming for my escape. I could hear ruffling behind me, and I still didn't turn back. When I finally reached the hole, I jumped through it and absolutely booked it to the first station that was a couple of streets down. The last thing I could hear when leaving the forest was an angry huff and metal meeting metal. I still don't know who it was or what they wanted from me, but I never ran in that forest again. So, creepy stalker or whatever you are, I truly hope we never, ever meet. I was in Belize for a multi-day diving trip with a girlfriend. This was her first dive trip after getting open water certified. We dove the blue hole and a few other spots, and because of the depth and the number of dives, we had to do a decompression stop for 5-10 to 10 minutes or so at the end of this last dive. During that last dive, my girlfriend was struggling with water getting in her mask and started to panic. We were between 45-60 to 60 feet down. I could see she was freaking out and pointing to her mask and slowly going towards the surface. I was trying to make signs to her that she had to stay down and to not go to the surface, but it was really hard to communicate that. At around 15 feet, I had to physically grab her and start pulling her down. She had a little air in her BCD which wasn't helping. I cleared any air from her BCD and just started pulling her down. It was really so scary. No one wants the bends. When we finally got on the boat, she thought I was just mad at her for not swimming with the rest of the group, thinking I didn't understand she was having mask issues and didn't realize what I was trying to tell her. This story is both darkly humorous but also terrifying at the same time. So, I got kicked out of my house when I was 15, and I'd been homeless periodically, and this was one of those times. It was cold, and I didn't want to be sleeping outdoors, so I had to go through social services, 
and they put me into what's called emergency housing. The people who approve the standards of some of these places need to be fired yesterday. They sent me to one of the worst neighborhoods ever, into a house where I was the only female, with four grown-ass men for housemates, and there was no one there supervising anything. Half the house was made up of a burnt-out porch. There were both rats and roaches of monstrous proportions, and usually no heat or hot water. Me and one of the guys ended up sharing a room. His name was Jay. One of our other housemates, I never actually saw this guy, and don't know if he even lived there anymore or what. Another one was usually decent, but he drank so much every night that he forgot how keys worked, so he was usually found passed out on the floor outside of his door. And then there was another guy, the crackhead. This guy was creepy as hell, and he had a lot of prostitute friends, and they knew that our front door lock generally didn't work so it wasn't uncommon to just run into random prostitutes making grilled cheese in the middle of the night when I got up to pee. Me and Jay also liked to mess with our crack addict roommate. We were stupid teenagers who didn't realize that crackheads can be dangerous, and we were both assholes who didn't have much to do, so we did like to screw around with him, because we kept telling him to please stop lining his teeth up on the windowsill by the kitchen table when they fell out from said crack usage because it's, you know, not the most appetizing thing to look at when you're eating. So one night, after a new tooth was added, we decided that we would just turn everything in the kitchen upside down, and then wait for him to come into the kitchen and pretend like it was perfectly normal. We spent a good four hours doing this, and it was almost impressive. It worked too well because he completely lost his shit after we kept telling him that the kitchen looked normal. What the fuck are you talking about? Also, it should be noted that it was December and we didn't have heat again, but this guy is jittering around the house in his tidy whities sweating like a sprinkler. So he goes into his room and he's cursing and slamming things around in there. Jay goes to go to the bathroom and I hear our roommate tearing out, and then Jay comes running into the room and slams the door, looking absolutely terrified. He throws the chain lock on the door and tells me we gotta move the beds and dresser against the door and that our crazy roommate has a sword or some shit. It was a machete and that thing comes blade first through the shitty door, exactly like in The Shining but with a crackhead. So we're frantically trying to move our mattresses against the door in the dresser and we have no other way out besides the window but we're gonna have to go quietly as hell under his window and run through the woods in the dark to get to the nearest payphone to call the cops. Luckily our roommate is still going at the door and making a ton of noise, so we were able to get past his window into the payphone. The cops were able to get to the house easily, because the front door was still unlocked for the prostitutes to come in. He was arrested fairly easily as he was tiny, and there were many cops there. Our roommate had several outstanding warrants, so he ended up getting locked up for quite a long time. Jay was and is a complete piece of shit, unrelated to the story. And after this happened, social services thought that maybe this wasn't the best housing arrangement for me, and I moved to a different location. I never heard anything else about our crazy roommate after that, as a lot of worse things happened, and this event was put into the past and for some reason it popped into my head again. It might not be perfectly suited to this subject, but I hope it entertained anyone who read it anyway. And yes, this is 100% a very real event that I went through. I've lived an odd life so far. And to touch up why Jay was a piece of shit, while I was at the place where the story took place, me and Jay had ended up becoming a couple. I had to go to another state for a week, and when I got back, things between me and Jay were off. Long story short, my brother and my best friend found out that Jay had cheated on me during the whole duration that I was away. Now, my brother was a year younger than me, and out of everyone I've ever had in my life, he was my true, true best friend, and we were extremely close. We both had the same friends, we played in each other's bands, we were extremely close. So when my brother found out about Jay cheating on me, he didn't take too kindly to it. 
so he beat the ever-living shit out of him. About a year later, my brother was murdered. So being that me and my brother were so close, obviously this was the worst thing that's ever happened in my life, and it devastated me and my family, especially my mom. A few months after my brother was killed, I went to get food with my mom, and guess who's there? This piece of shit, Jay. He found out what happened to my brother. He starts mouthing off that my brother got what he deserved. I'm trying to get at this guy, but my mom is begging me to just come with her and leave, and I didn't want to upset her anymore. So we head towards the parking lot. This fuck not only follows us out, he also pulls a knife on us and I just see red because he's now threatening my mom. I have this big-ass messenger bag that's crammed with stuff and heavy as hell, so I just swing it out and around as hard as I can, and I hit him on the side of the arm and head, so he dropped the knife. I kicked it away, pushed him as hard as I could, and ran to the car. My mom had gotten into the car and started it and backed out, so she had been ready to get out of there. All of this happened within a few seconds, so we just took off. No, we didn't call the cops, because my family had had more than enough to do with the cops, and they had already failed my family. And that's why Jay is a piece of shit. I was following a gray Toyota Tundra in a massive blizzard through Montana on McDonald Pass. He was going pretty quick most of the way, but must have been unfamiliar with how steep the final few miles are. He got away from me as I slowed down to about 35. Not five minutes later, I passed his tire marks in the fresh snow that went off the side of the mountain. I pulled over and looked down to see his truck upside down and on fire about 300 yards down. I called 911. He didn't die, but he was burnt up pretty bad. It's sad and scary. And don't go 50 in the snow just because you have a truck or four-wheel drive. When I was in college, I was out and about with my then-boyfriend. We'd gone to dinner, then went to Walmart to get some typical college food so we could survive a Sunday in. I was dressed up in a casual dressy fit. We decided to split up while we shopped to maybe get it done quicker, but I don't remember the exact reason why. I was wandering the grocery aisles when I noticed this girl who was about my age. In a friendly manner, we casually smile at each other and continue on shopping. It didn't seem weird at first but I kept noticing her in the same aisles as me, and a big, muscular man was never far behind us. Eventually, I texted my boyfriend and asked where he was and continued on shopping. Next thing I know, the girl approaches me and says how she loves my jacket. I say, thanks, Maurice's, and try to move on. She stops me and says something along the lines of, hey, you look like you're my age and seem really nice. I just moved here for a new job and company my friends and I are starting. And she tried to ask me questions about where I was from. I was vague and untrusting with what I said, noticing this isn't normal. Then she said, I'm looking for more people like you and I to work for our company. It's kind of a warehouse job and I would love you to be one of our bookkeepers. You should give me your number. I said, that's so nice of you to offer me a job, but I'm not a desk person and already have a job I love. That's a bummer. Well, would you want to give me your number so we can hang out? I would love to have a friend who can show me around the city, she said. I realized I wasn't getting out of this situation until my boyfriend showed up, or I gave her my number. Eventually, I rattled off a fake phone number and said, Hey, I will catch you later. I gotta go. Then I walked away, praying my boyfriend would be near so we could get out of there. While I was looking for him and trying to call him, the girl caught up to me and said, I tried to call you, but it said the number was out of service. And as I tried to come up with a quick excuse and say, 
Maybe you typed it in wrong. She saw that my iPhone was unlocked and in my hand. She quickly snatched it and called herself on it. I was so flustered and mad at her that I snatched my phone back right when my boyfriend came around the corner. He instantly recognized that something was up and said we needed to go. When the girl saw him approach me, she looked so disappointed to see him and stopped trying to interact. We ended up buying nothing and leaving. That night, we called our parents and the police. The police said they didn't think it was anything ill-intended, but I was sure it was probably trafficking. I was going to switch my phone number because I was so scared. I blocked them and turned off all location access on my phone. I was too scared to go anywhere alone for a while. I even told my coach so she knew. A couple days later, I got a text from a random number. It was the girl. She sent me a picture of my best friend who was out drinking downtown with some of her friends. The text said, I met your best friend. She gave me your number because I told her I was looking for new friends. She showed me a picture of you, and I said, What a coincidence. I met her the other day and lost her number when I got a new phone. About two minutes later, I get a text from my best friend that said, I gave your number to a girl who wants to make friends around here and is looking for people to join her business. And since I moved this week, I thought of you. I freaked out that she was with her. I told her to get away and not be left alone with her. I stayed up worried until my best friend got home. She said she was fine. Otherwise, I would have gone to pick her up. The next day, my best friend apologized and told me to block the number. My friend and her group tried to ditch her, but she kept showing up at the bars they were at. She said the girl was relentless and texted her all night, trying to get my friend to go hang out at her place. My best friend also said that when she asked about the business, the girl wouldn't give her many details, other than it was a warehouse somewhere, would pay her great, in town, and that if she wanted a tour of it, she would take her. We never heard from this girl again. Today, I was listening to a podcast, and they mentioned different sex trafficking tactics. Two of them were vague jobs, where they would pay you well, but needed you to come meet them to get more information. And the next was a new-to-town girl who desperately needs new friends. I've been thinking about this all morning, and I'm glad I felt uncomfortable and my friend didn't go with this girl but I'm mostly mad the cops ignored my concern and said it was nothing. I hope they wrote down the tip that night, but I doubt they did. In 2014, I was driving at night on Highway 81 in southwestern Oklahoma. It was around 2 a.m., and I hadn't seen another car for at least 30 minutes. I was on a stretch of road between Chickasha and Rush Springs. In other words, I was in the middle of nowhere. I come over a small rise and see a car upside down in the ditch and a body laying just out of the car. It kind of looked like he was sleeping on his side. I slam on the brakes and get out of the car and run over to the guy. I touch his shoulder and he kind of slumped over onto his back. It was then I could see his head was smashed flat on the left side, and his abdomen was open. I could smell whiskey coming out of his gut. It was horrifying. This man had no pulse, so I get my phone out and call 911. I give them an estimate of where I am. They tell me the nearest help is 25 minutes away, and I needed to wait with the wreck until they got there. Well, fuck. I hang up the phone and look around. I'm alone in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma, the only companion to a dead man. Not knowing what to really do, I took his hand and said the Lord's Prayer, and covered his face with a shirt that was hanging out of the car. I seriously was shaking a bit. It was then I heard the coyotes start turning up, if you haven't heard this sound, it's akin to small children being hurt badly. 
They wail and screech, in what I think is a big circle around me and this man. It's been 15 minutes and no other cars have shown up. I hear them on the highway. They are crossing just out of the headlights of my car. Now, I have a decision. Do I get in my car and let them come up and tear on this guy? Or do I find something to swing and protect his body? I chose the latter. I got the tire iron out of my trunk and go back over to where his body is. I guess I'm making a stand. I wait another five minutes. I hear them running around. It's really dark. I realize I'm not truly in control of this situation. Something very primal comes over my brain. It's akin to rage, along with a heavy dose of fear. Whatever was going to happen, I was going to fight like a crazed ape on the savannah. At this very moment, I see car lights. Finally, a car shows up, and wouldn't you know, it's a Pontiac Grand Am full of methed up country boys. They pull to the side and look me over, then see the dead man, then the car. I say, guys, that guy is dead and there are coyotes circling me. They go to their car and pull out several handguns and a couple of flashlights. They are wired for sound and excited as fuck to kill the shit out of these things. Although, they were almost as unnerving as the wild animals out in the dark. A couple of minutes pass, and we hear a siren off in the distance. The guys say, It's the cops. They jump in their car and haul ass. I'm alone again. Me. And this poor man. Sixty seconds later, a state trooper shows up. Then two deputy sheriffs. And finally three city cops from some small town called Ninica. And finally an ambulance. They look the guy over and pronounce him dead. Then they asked me at least a hundred questions, and finally asking if they could search my car for drugs. They search and find nothing. Then they tell me, thanks for staying with the wreck, you can go. I left, and start driving down this pitch dark road yet again. I feel like I've been in a battle for my life, and thinking our civilized behavior is little more than a thin veneer over a wild animal that wants to survive. This encounter would have happened a little over 10 years ago, but I cannot 100% remember what year this was now, but it was sometime from 2011 to 2013. I am a male, and I would have been about 26 to 27. At the time, I was frequently going out with my friends to bars and parties, and hanging out until pretty late most weekends. The friend's house that I usually hung out at was on a side street, just off of a main road where a lot of popular and crowded bars and restaurants were. He had a park on the street at his house, and during the weekend when it was busy, it was pretty common to have to park a number of blocks away. The street closer to the bars was pretty nice, but if you went a few blocks in the opposite direction, it got a little sketchier at night. After a night of hanging out, I had to walk back to my car pretty late, which was parked a number of blocks away towards the slightly sketchier area. This was during the winter, so I was wearing some kind of heavy sweater or pullover and a beanie or knit hat. This detail is only important, as you couldn't really gather much idea about what I looked like from a distance in the dark. Aside from my general height and build, there wasn't much through traffic as you got further away from the bars, and the roads were pretty dark without any street lights. As I was walking down the sidewalk, a car started slowly creeping down the street, matching my pace as it pulled up beside me, and then stopped. The window of the car rolled down, and driving the car was an attractive young woman who said that I looked cold and that I should let her give me a ride to where I was going. She seemed very friendly. I indicated that I wasn't parked very far away, and appreciated the offer, but I was just going to keep walking. She then tried really hard to convince me to get in her car with her, since it was so cold. There was no small talk to establish any information about me to make sure I wasn't a weirdo, just asking me to get in the car pretty aggressively. 
Based on what I was wearing and how dark it was, there was no way she really could have had much idea about what I actually looked like to possibly find me attractive. And even if she did, I don't know many women who would pick up a male stranger after midnight when they're alone in their car. There were about 10 bars nearby she could have gone to if she just wanted to pick up a guy. There was no reason that I could think of that she would have to resort to driving around, offering to pick up strangers. She continued to drive alongside me and offered me a ride again, which I declined and kept going. I picked up my pace and she eventually drove off. As soon as she was a few blocks away, I quickly got to my car and made sure there was nobody lurking around or close by. The whole scenario felt off and it didn't make much sense to me. I asked my friend about it later and all of the women agreed. They wouldn't offer a random guy a ride at night time in that kind of scenario, even if the guy looked like Ryan Gosling or Channing Tatum. My suspicion is that there was someone laid down in the back seat of the car, out of view with a weapon, waiting to rob anyone who accepted the ride. I couldn't really figure out any reason she would be offering rides like that to complete strangers in the middle of the night as it would be very unsafe for her just to pick up random strangers. I just assumed there had to be something nefarious going on in that car, and I do wonder what would have happened if anyone just hopped in the car with her. When I was probably 13, my family and I were on our way home from a Wednesday night church service. My mom was in the driver's seat, and I was behind her in the back. My five-year-old brother was in the middle, and my ten-year-old sister on his other side. We were just down the road from the church, but it was a country road and late, so there was no light and no one else on the road. We were just coming up to our turn, when all of a sudden a car comes swerving from our turning spot. This little car was taking the turn so fast that they came into our lane and almost hit us. We swerved as they tried to get into their own lane before we collided. Unfortunately for them, they overcorrected and their car flipped and landed on the driver's side door in the ditch. My mom of course hits the brakes and immediately jumps out of the car to go help whoever was in there. She got about three steps away from our car and stopped dead in her tracks. My sister and I are sitting there with our mouths hanging wide open, having no clue what to do. All I could think was, this isn't actually happening to us. This kind of stuff only happens in the movies. But why isn't my mom going to help the other person? It was summer, so we had all of our windows halfway down. I heard a person start yelling help from the inside, and my mom starting to move again to help him but for some reason, she stops again in the center of the road. Another car flies up behind us, and the guy doesn't hesitate to jump out and run up to the crash to help. The man gets to the car and starts prying the passenger door open so the guy inside can get out. I can see my mom wants to run and help, but it's like she can't move from that spot. The good Samaritan that pulled up behind us is able to get the door popped open, the guy from inside crawls out the door and gets into a frog-like crouching position on top of the car. At this point, my mom starts taking shuffle steps back to the car. When I look back at the guy, he has this crazy look on his face. He looks directly at our car and my mom and launches himself off the top of the car and hits the guy who was helping him. He starts running for our car at the same time my mom turns around and runs for our car. He must have known he couldn't get there before my mom did because he changed directions and moves to the car behind us. My mom jumps in and locks our doors just as the guy jumps in the empty driver's seat of the car behind us. He slams on the gas before he even closed the door and almost hits us taking off a second time. Next thing we know, the guy who was just carjacked runs up to my mom's window and starts screaming and knocking on the window. My mom is of course shaken and doesn't want to roll down the window, so she settles for cracking it so we can understand what he's saying. He's yelling, asking us to call 911 because his phone was in the car, 
along with his girlfriend. So of course my mom starts searching for a phone to call, but because she's so frantic from what just happened, she can't seem to find it. So I take a break from keeping my little brother and sister calm, and I dial 911 on my phone and hand it to her. While she's explaining what happened to the 911 operator, we hear a woman scream down the road. The man that was at our window takes off running and a few minutes later comes back with a severely scraped up woman in his arms that turned out to be his girlfriend. My mom unlocks the door at this point and he sets her in the passenger seat while we waited for the cops. The girlfriend told us that he noticed her while he was speeding off and he tried to hit her but she scratched and punched at him and while trying to plead with him to stop the car, he kept coming at her and finally rolled down the window and pushed her out going about 60. The cops finally showed up and talked to all of us to get our stories. While talking to one officer, he told my mom that the man had shot and killed a man behind some apartment complex. That's why he was driving so fast and trying to get away. When we finally got home, we were all told to go to bed, but of course I wouldn't be able to sleep that night, so I went downstairs to talk to my mom. I worked up the courage to ask her why she stopped running to the car when the other guy didn't. She told me that she had such a strong feeling that she should stay in the car with us that it was almost like she could hear it. When she heard him start yelling for help, she ran to help again, but just like the last time, she got the overwhelming feeling not to go to the car. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if my mom hadn't listened to that feeling. The man could have easily overpowered her and got into the car if she'd been any further away. I should also mention that the man was caught that night trying to steal a new car. He had already ditched the car he stole from behind us, so the thing that really helped him get convicted was when the woman was fighting him off. She grabbed the wrap off of his head before falling out. She didn't know she did until the police got there and found it by where she was pushed. He did go to jail but I was never informed of how long or anything else, and honestly, I never cared to ask. Back when I was still working at a rehab facility as a social worker for girls who were victims of sexual assault, it was out of town. I would take a jeepney and a bus as well to get to my workplace. I was an in-house social worker, meaning that I will stay at the facility for five days and I can get two days off. My shift is Saturday to Wednesday, meaning that I can go back home Wednesday evening and return to the rehab facility Friday evening. I like to travel during evenings since there are not a lot of passengers and I can enjoy my window seat alone. The facility is located in a rural area. I can take a tricycle going down there from the bus stop, but it's too expensive for me. I would always walk alone, and mind you, I have to pass through a white sugarcane field before going there. There's no consistent street lights there, but I didn't mind it, except for that one night. Just near the road was a small mom and pop store where I usually would buy my snacks. It's about a kilometer away from my workplace. I got close with the owner, and she would often say that she'd ask her son-in-law to drive me to my workplace. I always politely declined her offer because I don't want to be a burden on anyone. That time, she offered again and I took it, because when I looked down the road going to my workplace, it was dark. The air felt heavy and weird. I finished my Pepsi and cigarette and hopped on the back of the motorcycle, when we reached the middle part, there were five to seven drunk men talking in the middle of the road, and they saw us coming. One of the men said, Miss, come down and talk to us. I got scared and he walked closer. The woman's son-in-law instantly accelerated his motorcycle as fast as he could, and some of the men chased us while calling after me. Thank God they were not able to keep up. If I didn't trust my instincts... I don't know what would have happened to me that night.
My family and I are from Australia, and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday to America. We traveled from LA up the west coast, and then back down through Nevada. We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation, road trip style. One night, we were traveling towards Lompoc and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't to bring your own UV light, if you know what I mean. My mom and dad found a place that looked okay, and they went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night, while my sister and I stayed in the car and listened to music on our iPods. We were bopping along to the Frey album I'd bought that day, when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mom, what is she doing? I look up out the window and can see into the reception of the motel, and I see my dad talking to the manager and my mom displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with staff everywhere, so this was odd for her. What's wrong with her? I said to my sister, as we kept a close eye on them. My mom was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looking around the place as if she was on guard for something, as if her hypervigilant senses had kicked in. After some time, my mom and dad get back in the car and discuss what to do about staying the night. My dad stated we wouldn't find anywhere cheaper for the night, and he was hungry and ready for dinner, so we better just stay here. Plus, it was the last room available, so we would have to make a quick decision. To his dismay, my mom disagreed. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, said my mom. My dad argued on, getting more and more irritated that my mom couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place, until my mom finally snaps and yells over my dad, saying, We are not staying here. Fucking hell. Fine. My dad says as he starts the car and backs out of the motel driveway. At this point, my sister and I are looking at each other like, what just happened? But we stay quiet as mom seems on edge. Anyway, we end up finding a place to stay that mom approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we're all bustling around the motel room getting ready for the day when my dad turns up the TV to hear a news story about a shooting at the motel my mom didn't want to stay at. It turns out that about 15 minutes after we left, a couple walked in and booked the last room, and the man that was behind them shot them because they took the last room. We all turn to look at my mom, who's standing there wide-eyed, watching in horror. I told you I had a bad feeling about that place she said to my dad, who was pretending not to listen. The moral of the story is, always trust your gut, or better, your mom's gut. I had this experience years ago that I always think of, and wonder how differently things could have gone. So, I was around 17 to 18. I'd gone with a friend to a pub that wasn't so bothered with checking IDs, so we had quite a few drinks. We left when the pub closed and I walked my friend home. I was supposed to be staying at my sister's house to babysit for her the next day. I'd missed the last bus, so I decided to walk. This was a four-hour walk that I'd done plenty of times before during the day, and it didn't even occur to me that a girl wandering around on her own in the middle of the night, was a dumb move. So, I'm walking, and most of the route is through residential areas, some petrol stations and closed shops, that kind of thing. Around three hours or so into this walk, there's a 30 minute or so gap between one housing estate and the next, which is just country lane with fields either side. I know this country lane is coming up, and as I'm getting closer and the alcohol has worn off, I'm starting to think I'd made a stupid decision. The roads had been pretty quiet, and by now, it was probably around 3.30am. A white car drove past me, heading towards the country lane, but I didn't really think much of it. About a minute later, the same car drives back in the opposite direction, slowing down as it passed me. 
All of the windows were tinted, so I couldn't see who was inside. The car turned around further back and passed me again, heading back into the country lane area, and I thought, oh shit. I was coming to the end of the housing estate and closer to the country lane, so I darted off to my right into the housing estate and waited out of sight for what felt like forever, but looking back, it probably wasn't very long. I heard a car pass by a few times, and then all went quiet. I thought it was probably safe to continue now. I came out of the housing estate, looked about, and couldn't see anyone around, so I continued my journey. About five minutes or so into the quiet lane, the same white car drove past me from behind, and parked up a little way ahead in a lay-by on my side of the road. I slowed my pace and started to panic. I didn't want to turn around because then the car would be behind me, and that thought scared me even more. I couldn't cross over because there was no footpath on the other side of the road, so I'm just slowing my walking towards this white car, getting more and more scared. Just then, a taxi pulled up next to me, and the driver wound down his window and asked if I wanted a lift home. I was already panicking and almost screamed at him that I don't get into cars with strangers. He said he had a daughter about my age, and he wouldn't want her out at this time. I looked at the taxi, looked at the white car, and just ran and jumped into the taxi. As we drove off, I looked back and saw the white car speed off in the other direction. The taxi driver dropped me off at my sister's house. I always think back and think firstly, how can I be so stupid? Secondly, what would have happened if that taxi driver hadn't stopped? This takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana. It was a weekend night, and my best friend and I were coming home after our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. So we start heading out into the country where I live, and to get to my house, there's a long narrow dirt road you have to go down. About a mile or so in, we see a truck's headlights. We get closer, and it's a nice truck, probably like a 2018 at least. He's parked to worry sideways, blocking the whole path. Confused, I get out and ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. I'm just waiting on a friend to come get me. My truck stuck. He smiled at me, and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He looks back to my car and sees that I have someone with me, and he looks at the dog sticking his head out of the window. His smile fades. He says, Pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back in his truck. I go back to my friend and I'm like, put this shit in reverse and use whatever hood race skills you have to get us out of here. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on a dirt road anyway and back all the way up down that road and get back to the main road. Relieved, we take a different road home. Then, lo and behold, the same guy is parked on that road, standing off to the side, smiling, just looking into our headlights. We were completely about to shit ourselves, and we gunned it the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us, or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful I wasn't alone, being my naive college girl self. Back when I was 18 to 19 years old, I was house-sitting with a girl I was studying with. The family we were house-sitting for went to the same church as her, but I didn't really know them well myself. It was more to keep her company in a huge house. This was 1997, when the average teen like me didn't have a cell phone. During the week that we were house-sitting, it was a short break in the school calendar, which is why this family was away and why the streets in the area were quieter than usual. My apartment as well as the house we sat for was not far from the university. 
My apartment was actually a three minute walk from it, and the house a further five minutes by car. So being a student neighborhood, it was particularly quiet this week. The first weird thing that happened the week I was at this house was that I dreamed I was driving through a dark forest on a windy, hilly dirt road with no lights anywhere except for those from my car's headlights. As I started to go down a hill, the headlights suddenly cut out and everything went dark. The car slowed down to a stop and died. I woke up. In the morning, I went out to my car and it wouldn't start. It had been working perfectly the day before. I had to call a guy to come fix it. It was the starter motor. Well, that was the first creepy thing that happened that week. A day or two later, it was Friday. I planned on driving back home to my parents, who lived in a smaller town about 45 minutes away. I packed up my stuff at the big house and was going to head over to my apartment to collect whatever else I needed for the weekend. The trip between the house and the apartment was, as I mentioned, only five or so minutes away. Since it was winter, it was dark by the time I left at around 7pm. As I was driving from the house, I noticed in my rearview mirror the headlights of a car behind me, tailing me really close. When I turned, it turned. Back then I was cautious, but not overly so. Cautious enough to notice in such a short distance that something weird was going on behind me. But then when I pulled up to a traffic light, it wasn't there anymore. Relief. Short-lived, though. The car was now beside me. I looked to my right, and there was a man inside, alone, smiling at me, slightly maniacally. I also thought, well, he's in the lane to turn right, so I'm all good. I pulled off, and the headlights were behind me again. So close, I could barely see them over the back of my car. What an ass, I thought. Who drives like that? Thank goodness my turn is coming up on the left soon. After another minute or two of this tailgating, I slowed down, strategically didn't indicate, and made a sudden sharp left into my driveway, opened the automatic gates, and shot inside. The gates closed behind me. Yay. The drama was over. I gathered a few things from the car to take up with me, and noticed on my way over to the stairwell that there was a man at the gate that had just closed behind me. He was still on the other side, and I was at the far end of the parking lot, but I could make out it was the guy from the tailgating car. He was jumping up and down, shaking the gate with absolute rage. Well, I was safely on this side, so I wasn't completely gripped with fear. And besides, there was a group of students making a noise nearby arriving for a party or something. I headed to the stairs and started going from the basement slash ground level to the first floor. Rounding the stairs on the first floor, I noticed someone running across the parking lot towards the staircase. In hindsight, I still can't fathom why I didn't put two and two together. I guess it's because I subconsciously knew that there was a group being led in through the pedestrian gate. As I was rounding the staircase between the second and third floors, someone suddenly touched me. I spun around. It was the guy. He'd slipped in as part of the small crowd. He said something. I said something sassy back and told him to fuck off. Then I turned my back on him to continue up the stairs. I lived on the third and last floor. He grabbed me from behind, held my back against his chest, with his left arm around my neck. I felt something being held against my right side. Shit. A knife. He led me down. I remember thinking that the light was broken on the bottom level. This can't end well. But I was calm. I resisted slightly. He tightened his grip. I felt like I wasn't getting enough oxygen. I started to become a dead weight. He started to drop me. I was groin level. I elbowed. It connected. He dropped me but spun around to face me. He ripped the front of my button down top, and he stopped. He looked at someone behind me, someone taller than him. His eyes went wide. He turned and ran. I screamed. Then I too turned around to see who'd come to help. 
there was no one there. But people came out of their apartments after that. The police were called. This was the second time they were there that night. I didn't know. It turns out that the other weird thing that happened was that my dad had already called the police and they'd come past an hour before. My mom had a weird feeling all evening and hassled my dad endlessly that something bad was going to happen to me. She had been right. As it turned out, they caught the guy. I identified him in a lineup. He had 14 accounts on sexual assault on women. One had thrown herself out of the first floor of her apartment to get away from him, and she'd broken her leg. Weeks later, the police called me. Before his trial, his cell door had been left open. He was gone. Apparently, it was an inside job. To preface this, I love to drive, like hours long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind, just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventual cities, and I'd usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license four to five years ago and I've never once had any sort of issue, nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort out personal issues. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a mean of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a clusterfuck of personal issues that I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend. I couldn't focus on anything else. I decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and not to be gone for too long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life. So I decided to drive further north, down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend, and I was just admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight, in seemingly the middle of nowhere the few houses miles back from the road lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in the snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror, or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then, I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now, it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about, right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of a sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder, while the rest was jutted out onto the road, 
kind of like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do it. The driver's side door was flung open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it toward the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. The cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle, that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside, with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds, and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was still a part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night, and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music, and called out, Hey! Anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment there was reception, I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I figured out my next course of action then. So, again I shout, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadow of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah. I was relieved at first, and was about to say something in response, or possibly even stop my car and get out, when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan, and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person did not have any blood on them or appeared injured in any way. They were wearing a mask, not like the face mask for the pandemic or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was. I couldn't get a good look. But from its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a bat out of hell. My heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me. Though I had no clue what they were saying, I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow and chase me, or if they'd stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road, watching me. And right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks, and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer, to tell him what happened and what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, 
did they follow me, and stuff like that. He told me since it was out of city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police and sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for the police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through the hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even ten or so minutes ago. He was, as you can imagine, really freaked out for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement, so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with them until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who did it. Though, with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark-colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they have any leads, and I'm not sure they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here, and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car, or just a ruse to get more attention? If it was really blood, did they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I'd stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere, and I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Joy, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.